My name is John Ford Essex, I'm a borough and county councillor for the Green Party in Surrey and, and there also we've set up a Surrey Climate Commission to get the businesses, the public sector, wider civil society and the councils all working together. Um, I'll touch a bit on Surrey, maybe in the presentation, but you can always quiz me afterwards if you, if you like about what, what they're doing or, or, or not doing. Um, but I'm here really as, as an author of, of Greenhouse, of, of this latest book on, on climate reality. We've, we've done two books so far as Greenhouse. The first one was imagining that, if you like, in the peak oil era, we're running out of easy oil, we're running out of um, resources, and, and we're getting to the stage where we, when we use more, we are just making the world a little bit more unequal. <coughs> so we should accept that we need to go beyond economic growth and look at a post-growth society. So we, we, we did that as a piece of work, which was setting out what changes we might make. This was more about, well, climate change surely is the reason why we should get on and do that. We should get on and transition to that, to that different future. And, but why aren't we? What's, what's stopping us? And it, it feels like that we've got through stage one of climate denial, which is um, every time there's a, a debate with a climate scientist, there needs to be someone on the debate telling us that science doesn't exist and we shouldn't have science. <coughs> it feels like we're at stage two of, of the denial steps. So um, if we are truly responding to the level of emergency that climate faces us, we should all be acting. This probably should be fuller than the, the, the town hall, if you like. Now, this should be a conversation with which everyone engages in. Because it's not about meeting a target by a certain time, but doing as much as we can and being as far below that target as possible. But when I hear conversations quite often, it's, well, it's they that need to do something. It's the business, is this. It's China. It's America. Well, we're the council. It's the government that needs to act. We're the government. It's the councils that need to act. Well, we can't do anything because. We can't do anything until. We'd like to act, but um, money, but the plans will be written, but the laws aren't good enough. It's almost like we've recognised there's a huge problem in the world. We know that we all need to act together, but then one by one, each of us seems to be required by the world we live in to tie both hands behind our back and, and look around, taking on observer status, waiting for someone else to do what needs to be done. So this book challenges that thinking. Um, challenge my operation, but oh, here we go. Another PowerPoint slide. This is an old slide. It only goes up to 2004. <coughs> the good news is, if you take this beyond, our consumption emissions in the UK have now started to go down. But if you listen to the government, what they will do is they will focus on this line. This line is the amount of carbon emissions produced within the UK. But clearly, we're a society that travels internationally, that brings sh ships, stuff from around the world. And what we consume is far more than what we produce. Um, instead, that's 500, 550, 750. So it's not double, but it's quite a lot more. And that's because a lot of the energy that we don't consider is what's in what we build, what we build and what we buy. The stuff that we consume rather than the direct energy consumption. You know, so, so climate change is a far bigger challenge than, it, than it's made out to be. The idea that we're somehow dealing with the problem slowly. Um, actually, the problem has got a lot bigger since we talked about as if we were dealing with the problem. So, 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 so then to the book. So I was going to give you a, a quick rush through from notes, if I may, of the different chapters in the book. I'm going to kick off with, your, with the, the overall um, author of the book. John Foster, who edited it. He addresses a question really about how do you feel about the future? How do you feel about the future? How do you... Um, that's an equal amount of pessimism and optimism. Possumist? Yes. Uh, yes, possumist. <laughs> um, optimistically, um, yeah, sceptical. Any other, any other thoughts around? Desperate. Desperate. Depressed. I'm optimistic. I think we will do this. I'm hopeful. Hopeful? Cautiously hopeful. Cautiously hopeful. Um, I think John Foster's possibly more pessimistic than the audience we have here today. 
What he pictures is what we need to think of as what he calls radical hope. He, he describes the future as, as a future that's going to get worse. There's a lot of climate change locked in. We're going to get at least a metre or two of sea level rise in the next century or, or so. We don't know how quickly it's going to come, but it's on its way. And that's going to increase the disasters, their frequency, their severity, how much disruption they cause. But on the other hand, what he says is we shouldn't give up hope completely. So I think there is hope in this room, which is great. He says, you know, we're going to have disasters, the apocalypse isn't yet locked in. So in that space between um, things getting worse and things getting impossible, we need to live and find hope in that space. And he describes that as radical hope. Joanna Macy's written, um, she calls it active hope. And I love that phrase because it's, it's, it's not the hope of an ostrich sticking your head in the sand while business as usual drives the sand um, castle over the cliff. You know, it's, it's very much the hope uh, of, of doing something, um, doing something collectively. So that's John Foster kicking off on the, on the philosophy. Nadine Andrews and Paul Hoggett then uh, from the Climate Psychology Alliance, they are exploring um, the, the physiological and the, and the psychosocial dimensions uh, of climate grief um, and how it can be overcome. And, and I'll have to read this because this is what they said. Um, they they recognise that there are powerful emotions brought to bear by disasters and strong grief associated with how we're thinking about the future. And we need to negotiate and deal with the inner tensions and conflicts that we feel. It produces stress and anxiety. Naturally, that leads to coping strategies and defences. So, climate denial is not so much a person, it's a natural reaction to what we're up against. Um, distraction, which could be about denying the scale of the problem. Um, we may come to climate emergencies later on that regard. Uh, responsibilities for action. Uh, and, and also it leads to suppression and diversionary activity. Um, I, for me, that's about watching TV, uh, following in depth some thing that <coughs> happens every single week and it becomes very important, or checking the scores of the Premiership football uh, results on diligently every, every Saturday afternoon. I mean, how important is that compared to the scale of the challenge? Or resignation, or wishful thinking, or even believing that a few of us on our own are somehow going to be significant in solving that when it actually needs all of us to act together. And they posit the alternatives. The alternatives are about engaging with facts, regulating our emotions, reflecting on our grief, solving problems together, having compassion and connecting with nature. And they say it's really important we don't suppress our emotions, but we work with and, and through our emotions. And they again talk about hope. They, they talk about hope which comes from being able to face the worst and then direct that towards what Jonathan Lear describes as a future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. So it's not just a determination and courage, but also a love uh, and, and a refinding of all that is good in the world. Brian Heatley takes a different perspective in his chapter in the book he explores the opposite end of climate change, when we had to adapt recently in the, in the mini ice age to it becoming colder in the UK. And that, that exploration was about how it is possible for us as a society to adapt, and adapt relatively quickly. Um, other examples along similar lines are the Green New Deal group that have talked about how we need to take almost a wall fitting approach and create a carbon army to retrofit every single house across the UK. Or more recently, this year, the Rapid Transition Alliance has produced an amazing little pamphlet which gives examples from history of where we've made changes really fast. So if you haven't checked it out, check out the Rapid Transition Alliance. It's much cheaper than this book, it's free, it's on the internet. <laughs> and uh, I was going to say Anne Chapter, but Anne Chapman's chapter um, was about modern day disasters which are being increased by climate change. Her experience of living through the recent flooding in, in Lancaster. And the thing that struck me was how flooding of one electricity substation led to a transformation of people's behaviour and relations to each other in the space of 24 hours and 48 hours. Because that electricity substation meant that there was no longer any mobile phone signal, 
and no longer ability to charge any mobile phones. And many households, that was the only phone they had. That was the only means they had of contacts in the outside world. So suddenly on the Saturday morning, people were in the high street talking to people they didn't know, asking them what was going on, how long would it last. And in the other end of the spectrum, people had been flooded out of their houses, were unable to be put up into the local hotel. Because the local hotel had what, uh, you know, these little credit cards you put in the, in the doors. Well, they didn't work because there, there was no electricity. So all these empty rooms in the hotels that could be used to put people up in the... who'd be flooded out of their houses. And, and a couple of students are very lucky they didn't have a fire in their, in their accommodation block because they got locked in. And then someone needed to um, get through the front door with a hacksaw blade and cut through the hinges. Again, because it was locked uh, because of the electricity ban. So it's about how things are connected and how resilient our local societies really are. Rupert Reid and, and, uh, and, and Kristen Steele, in, in their chapter, focused on similar aspects, climate disasters, but they looked further afield. Um, and, and about how, where people have experienced climate catastrophes like uh, Katrina in, in America, it's, it's often an opportunity to rebuild local communities, to strengthen community ties. Now, I resonate with that chapter in a big way. I, I spent just over a year living in Bangladesh, and I lived through a one in 10 year monsoon in 2004. And I witnessed a huge amount of collaboration at a local level, partly because the government was really not doing that much. Uh, it was very much around people and their survival. And, and, and the culture was there. Um, in, in Bengali, there are eight different words for cousin, four different words for grandparents, still. Um, maternal and paternal difference. So they had strong family ties which were brought together to respond. Um, which meant that flooding didn't kill so many people. The deaths were more from cholera and from sea snake bites in, 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 that, in that monsoon. Um, issues which you really rely on, you know, bigger issues like the government to take on, on board. And for me that's the crucial aspect. And that's picked up in a chapter by Peter Newell, who's, a, who's an academic and professor down at Sussex University. And what he did in his chapter was explore how international relations will be affected by climate change. And uh, I'd ask you to have a strong cup of coffee or something before you delve into that chapter. He basically explains how governments, uh, particularly focusing on security and conflict, are already considering and planning climate change into strategic decisions which are being made. So even while governments are failing to take action to deal with climate change, the consequences are already being factored into international relations, security, diplomacy, and so forth. Um, I wish it was the other way around, but it doesn't seem to be so. Um, there is a chapter also on capitalism. Um, it's the first chapter. So you have to get beyond that before you, no, you don't have to read the chapters in order. Um, so so the, uh, he looks at the current economic system and capitalism and questions whether we can deal with climate change with our current economic system. Um, I'll leave you to see what the answer he concludes is and what the consequences of that thinking might be. And one, one final, final chapter I just refer to briefly is, is that of Rupert Reid, who's a... Uh, um, he was chair of Greenhouse when we started this book. By the time we'd finished thinking about climate reality, he was pretty much on TV as an ex artsbakes person. Um, and, and I think that, that reflects his commitment to this issue, that you know, we can't just stand there writing books. Uh, we've actually got to go and do something. But, but his chapter was quite theoretical, uh, himself and Helena Paul. They were, they were looking at um, geoengineering. And to what extent we can, we can fix the problem um, through various geoengineering uh, aspects. And, and for me, geoengineering could be summarised in a, in a short phrase which you may have heard, um, which is about carbon capture and storage. Many of the, the reports, uh, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees centigrade warming, published just over a year now, and I think that's very much motivated the climate strikes, the XR movement, uh, and the prominence of, of Greta Thunberg from Sweden. I mean, that report set out various scenarios we can follow to stay within um, the current scientist's estimate of our carbon budget. And only the first, I think, 
actually requires us just to reduce. The others are almost saying, well, um, you can continue burning the coal for a little bit longer, but while you burn those fossilised trees, can you create some huge forests and bury those trees underground, metaphorically, while you continue to dig up the trees that have grown over the last million years? And, and I think it's that kind of um, thinking, um, what would I call it? Um, Jekyll and Hyde thinking? Um, schizo schizophrenia, I think, is almost built into this, this, this way of thinking that, that makes me worry that if we simply take the scientist's approach and say, you can take any one of those four options to get to the future. Well, actually, um, the planting a forest the size of India um, without impacting areas where food can come from or wildlife can live, um, and, and, and capturing gases that are produced from coal-fired power stations in the future, even when we don't do it today, is a bit far-fetched. And, and it brings me home to where I am as an engineer. As an engineer, I think of burning things. And we don't just burn coal. <coughs> we burn coal so we can burn rock. We burn coal so we can burn iron ore to make steel in a blast furnace. So I'm looking around for some steel, possibly up there. One tonne of steel is 2.7 tonnes of carbon emissions. We burn clay to make bricks. So a tonne of bricks is uh, around a fifth of a tonne of carbon emissions. As a result of that, every single time you build a house, it could be 30, 40, 50 tonnes of carbon. So as we make our economy bigger, as we keep building things, just like that first graph, that the energy in building things needs to be considered and reacted to. So that brings um, to a little story I was going to tell you, which, which is about um, what happens with developments around the world. If we are going to deal with the reality of climate change, are we going to continue to continue to develop in the UK? I know we're a developed country, but we still have these people called developers that still think that they need to do more development. Um, I, I was working in Bangladesh. This is um, an image of a, a dike, a sea dike which was breached um, by uh, by a storm surge which took out a large area of agricultural land and left a group, of, a group of local people homeless. Those people probably now are working in Dhaka because when people are, are moved away from their rural areas they can no longer support the livelihood, they've ended up in the capital city. Bangladesh has been referred to the world, by the World Bank as a development surprise. The garment industry has grown by 15% every year for the last couple of decades. Why? I think the why is because people have been removed from their land by worsening and worsening climate situations and they've been exploited in factories, in poor working conditions in the capital, such that we can buy cheap clothing here. So when you look at the climate front line in Bangladesh, think of the climate front line, not so much Bangladesh, but you could call it Primart, the shop which buys stuff from the factories that fell, fell down in Rana Plaza. And then if you think of a city and you think of flats, that's what the cities of China look like. Cities only account for three quarters of the world's climate emissions, but yet we're building more. This city didn't exist 50 years ago. This is Chongqing on the, on the Yellow River in the middle of China. We are literally urbanizing the planet. And if you believe the predictions, um, if we continue to grow the world's populations and we move to 75% of the world population living in cities by 2050. That means by that time there will be twice as many people living in cities then, then in the future, at that time as they are now. Now if we do everything the same as we are now, that means rather than 1 billion people living in, the, in slums around the world, there will be 2 billion people living in the world around the slums. But while some people live poorer, in bigger numbers, there will also be the same amount of houses made of bricks, roads made of tarmac, steel, concrete, etc. as we have today. So can we afford to do that? Can we afford not just to increase the population, but to have more and more population concentrated in cities linked together with glo by globalisation, rather than what we have more around the world and less here, is cities with a rural hinterland which supplies those, small, those smaller cities and the towns around them with more of their resources in a local way.
And we make, when we make those decisions, who has a say? That's the challenge I, I, would, I would pitch. I, I'm standing here today not because um, polar bears won't be able to climate change, but because I met people in Bangladesh and I feel that their future is very much in our hands. So the reality of climate change may not change our lifestyles here very much in the next decade or so. We might not be able to get certain foods, certain foods might get a lot more expensive, but the, the, the livelihoods or lives of other people will potentially change quite a lot. That's a picture of, I don't know if you can see these pictures very well. Um, that's an image. <laughs> it's a vague image of a, of, of a flooded street in, in Bangladesh when I was there. Um, this is a report I would urge you to read. Um, I stuck it at the top of my face, my, my Twitter feed, so anyone who um, dares to follow me on Twitter and looks to see who I am, they'll find climate change at the top of my Twitter feed. This is a report by Tim Jackson. It's called Zero Carbon Sooner. So if you just Google Tim Jackson Zero Carbon Sooner, what he basically does is takes the climate science and say, okay, if we do things in a fair way worldwide, how quickly should we get to zero in the UK? And he basically says you can, we can either reduce it in a linear way in the next five years, or we can reduce it exponentially in the next 10 years. It's the area under the graph that matters, but either way, that's pretty soon. So at one extreme, we follow XR, at the other extreme, it's the Green Party. That's the kind of range of targets we're looking at. And he also says that you know, we're reducing our emissions in the, in the UK faster than the emissions of what we buy from around the world. So I think that we need to challenge the idea that we can sort of do things in our own patch without looking at the wider connections. The wider connections at the moment are called free trade deals with America, um, uh, expansion of airports, um, and, and, and seeing our future as part of a more and more global economy. That future isn't consistent with very, very fast action on climate change. It's, it's, it's almost like trying to, uh, try to fill a bath whilst while drilling holes in the bottom. Yeah, it doesn't really work. So what do we do instead? I think we need to challenge not just our direct emissions and what we do and think of the challenges, energy supply, moving away from fossil fuels, but the whole way in which our use of fossil fuels drives consumer demand, drives us ever to produce and consume more things. I wish I could flip those two around because I don't think it's always the, uh, uh, that way around in terms of the relationships in the household. I think the biggest consumption items are things like a bigger house and a bigger car, for example, maybe come from the other direction. So that, this is what I posit you. I'll read it out so, so you can see. This is, this is, I think, the real problem in the world that we need to address. It's economic growth made real. Um, what happens is um, we build a house. When we build a house, there's suddenly a demand to produce more carpet, another TV, another fridge, some sofas, all the things we put in every single roof, roof in the house, as well as a demand for things like bricks and windows and doors and stuff. So we increase production of all those things. Once we've increased production of them, um, we start using them. And then we have all this stuff in our house, and then we want to move to a bigger house, so we build another house. And we keep going around. And you can, you can follow, follow that story, if you like, for cars and for roads. You know, we, we build a road, uh, and, and then we need increased production of cars, so we have more cars, so there's more congestion, so we build another road, or we build another airport, or another runway. Um, it's the same story, it's the same process. And what's happening in the world is we use lots of energy and concrete and bricks and steel to make everything bigger, and that increases the demand for other things, which also use lots of energy. But we really only focus on the energy used by us, us as consumers. And the government makes us feel really bad that we're burning all this energy in, in our cars and in our homes and in our heating. But that's partly because of the system we live in that's constantly building more roads and more runways. So as a greenie looking at economic growth, the way we challenge that is to stop the projects that make the problem worse. You know, if you have a hole, please stop digging. Uh, is the best way um, to solve the problem. Um, but what do we hear? We have here sort of like a lots of stuff going on. There's lots of news, but what is actually changing? So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about Surrey now. This is the Surrey story, the Surrey part of the thing. So we have a local issue where, near where I live, I live, live at Red Hill. If you uh, do your geography by large infrastructure projects that cause carbon damage, then we're at the bottom of the M25, or halfway between London and the uh, Gatwick. In Gatwick, the local campaign against Gatwick expansion is Gatwick is big enough already. I think that's a really simple message that we could put out in, you know, our road network is big enough already. Let's not have a Conservative Party say we need to ring fence all road tax to spend on even more road projects, which I think is what they're planning in their little election that they've cut, uh, cooked up for us all. So, so we're campaigning Gatwick expansion. Gatwick wants to expand in spite of the government saying only Heathrow can expand and have more planes and stay within our carbon emissions which requires to have less carbon. So even with the stupidity of expanding one airport, the reason they think they can do it is because they can get it under this thing called emergency runway. So they can use their emergency runway as a second runway. However, <coughs> this emergency runway they're planning to move uh, to, to, sorry, they're planning to use as a, as a regularised extra bit of runway space is a thousand metres long roughly than the current runway that's used as emergency and it's 12 metres further off to one side. So they're just going to slide the emergency runway along and then they'll use it again. I think then we might have to put some stuff down. Also we have this, this thing, another thing that's big enough already, we need to stop drinking for oil. So I live in a county which has just declared a climate emergency and then a couple of weeks after that uh, gave planning permission for the second largest onshore oil well in the UK. It's not cast as flat fracking because it doesn't use much water. It, it threatens either to use acid or actually ju just drills straight through an earthquake fault because that causes some, some interest. So, you know, what's going on here? If, if we're a climate emergency can't just be about doing good things, we need to stop making the problem bigger. And I think that's a really part, important part of the actions we need to take. But there's some good news. Um, things aren't getting up for already. You know, we are the problem. The demand for car use, which is this graph here, has plateaued. That hasn't really gone up since 1990. What's happened consistently from 1990 till today is the government keeps predicting it's going to go up like this. And as a result of that, keeps building more roads. So we can drive around as if those adverts were true, that you can drive along the road and not see another car. Mm. Apart from the places where there's congestion, so we'll build another road. And the government doesn't actually allow money to be spent locally for a shift of public transport, or to a shift to walking and cycling, or pedestrianisation of the town centre, unless there's also an increase in road capacity. So we have to win this argument and say, look, Common sense is dealing with climate change. Thankfully, most people agree with us. We stop using our cars to travel these big distances. It's not happening. But we need to change things. So the challenge is really for the rest of, the rest of this presentation is how do we do that? So for the last couple of years, I've been working on a project saying, OK, well, let's assume um, that we're going to deal with climate change. Let's assume that it isn't just down to the government of whatever day, whatever party rules the country, but more action needs to be taken locally. Because rather than big top-down projects like, I'm going to make this road bigger, or build a nuclear power station, or approve an oil well, we need to have a lot and lot of local actions instead. We need to put pan solar panels on so many buildings. We need to plan the places where wind turbines should go in every local area rather than having no plan and have local objections because there isn't a plan. We plan where waste facilities should go, we plan where houses should go, why don't we plan where renewable energy should go? We should have a plan. We should plan for our food and farming to be more local, more organic, and there'd be enough food production in the UK to support the level of food consumption in the UK. Is that possible? If it is, why shouldn't we do it? Because that would mean that the quarter of our freight transport in the UK, which is used to ship food around the UK, is going to be massively reduced. We should look at waste. Why can't we have 90% or more reuse and recycling? Why do councils invest in incinerators? Why not instead invest in plants to sort the recycling out into high quality recyclers that can be sent off well, ideally not sent off, used to make things go locally. All that will create jobs. 
And if the council owns the infrastructure to improve recycling, rather than a contract to burn it, it would be incentivised to do the right thing. And hopefully that's, that message would come across to us, a business too. So we've done a report looking at where those jobs would be across the UK in sectors of waste and transport and energy and buildings and food. And what we found, um, once we crunched the numbers, is what the numbers sort of told us was, you know, renewable energy is, is something that's dependent on the land area. You need to have the land area to put the renewable energy in. You just put it in one place, it's all over the place. <laughs> um, food and farming, some of it's in urban areas, most of it's in rural areas, and it's quite spread out across the UK. Buildings are dependent on where everyone lives and where the buildings are. Waste is dependent on where everyone lives, and transport is as well. But overall, what that means is more of the jobs to deal with climate change, disproportionately, will be in rural areas. They'll be in small villages, in small towns. Per capita, they will not be jobs in London or in big cities. So dealing with climate change will take the economic direction of the UK in the opposite direction it's going now. So rather than capital centred growth, professional jobs in the big cities, what we need is entrepreneurial startups, enterprises, a, a flourishing of a local economy where different parts work well with each other. Um, to create a different sort of future. So where I, I live, I'm a, I'm a trustee of a, a local furniture reuse charity. We deal directly with the women's refuge because when anyone comes out of the women's refuge, they get all the furniture for free. We also work with the housing associations. The housing associations then work with the, the homelessness drop-in shelter. <coughs> and it's that sort of ecology of connections which I think we need to create to deal with climate change. It's not just the, the climate, it's about the use of resources and how that affects how we relate to each other. So rather than government creating jobs and an economy centred on the big cities, what if the transition to, to deal with climate change actually was able to sustain a rural economy as well as an urban economy, was able to revitalise uh, a mining village, an uh, ex-mining village in Durham, or, or or a small village in Lancashire, or a place with high levels of unemployment that used to be an industrial centre in the north of England? What if we were able to rebalance the economy? Because that's what climate change would naturally do. Rather than continuing to globalise our economy and focus our energy in the concrete, bricks and steel used to make our cities bigger and massive infrastructure to connect cities with each other, what if instead we grew a rural economy as the vital thing on which every town and city was to stand. So rather than uh, effectively an increasingly urban and carbon intensive economy, almost hang off sky hooks if you imagine, we actually make sure that our economies are grounded based on the land and the energy and the renewable resources we need to live in a sustainable way. So to end, I would urge, I don't know if you can read these books, it says, how to work. I have to read it here in a second. How it works, how it is made. So, you know, I think we need to almost take the resources we have. And, and I heard at lunchtime today from a professor at, uh, or a co, co collaborator, co investigator at uh, Summer University. A piece of work has been, been done about, instead of the idea of productivity being about how much resources and energy and money you can produce from every hour of work, what if we had an economy that said, this is what we've got, can we keep as much of what we've got and keep it in good condition? So we reduce the amount of energy and resources and stuff which goes in, and we reduce the amount of energy and resources and stuff that we consider as waste. So what if we've got most of what we want here? What if we are a developed country? What if we have heritage and we have culture? What if we want to have more local employment and jobs and, and take that to the future? But what if we think, what, what if we treasure you know, the tables and the chairs and the stuff which we have? And think about the jobs to keep that going and sustain us. Because ultimately, sustainability is the ability to sustain things, is to keep better care of what we've got. So I'll end you with a, with a picture maybe of, of what political action might look like that brings that about.
by telling you a, a short story from Elizabeth Sartoris. She talked about um, what happens when a caterpillar gets bigger. There are these things called imaginal cells that sit around doing nothing in a caterpillar. As it gets through the first load of food, sheds its skin, continues to grow, and continues to grow, and continues to grow. But at some point, something in the caterpillar decides that it's big enough already. It can't get any bigger. And these imaginal cells, maybe they're the greenies hidden in the caterpillar, I don't know, but they kick into life and they start to cluster together. And when they cluster together and form little, little groups, uh, uh, they, they start to direct chaos within the, the caterpillar body. And things that were considered business as usual while the caterpillar plopped up along um, stopped functioning. And the caterpillar went slow. It slowed down everything it did until it stopped. And then it stopped and it rethought and it regrouped in terms of what it was. And when it was reborn, it was much lighter in its carbon footprint than before. It was powered by sunlight, and it was beautiful. And that's our challenge. Thank you.